I'd like to say a few words about contraception. And it's a problem that some people, a few people, think is important. And the first thing I'd like to talk about is how important is it. The, the Pope, our present Pope, Benedict XVI, said that uh, the Church is teaching humanae vitae, which of course is the modern letter that uh, spells out the Church's constant teaching on contraception, that it's always unlawful. It's a, Benedict XVI said that the teaching of that letter is crucial for the future of the world. Okay, that's kind of important. Cardinal Burke recently said that the, um, the new evangelization can't take place without the church's return to the teaching, the perennial teaching on contraception. So if you have a model of the reform of the church, which then is able to reform society, you can't do anything unless the church the church as a whole turns back, turns into uh, the acceptance, the understanding, the embrace of the teaching of humanae vitae. Well, that sounds pretty important, too. <clears throat> if, you, uh, if, you, if I can take you back to 1948, there was a, a Dominican who wrote a, there was this, I don't know if you're familiar with it, this Blackfriars edition of of St. Thomas Aquinas. It's these three huge volumes. And in the last volume, towards the end, they have a series of modern articles written pretty much by Dominicans. And uh, they talk about, they get of a modern spin on what St. Thomas taught. And there's this article on marriage by a fellow, I think his name is Marr. And he says, that if the world doesn't accept the church's teaching on marriage, and by that he means contraception and the things that follow from contraception, divorce, uh, sex outside of marriage, fornication, if the church doesn't accept that, it's the end of civilization. Well, have I got your attention now? We're talking about the end of civilization. That if the people continue on this road of not accepting, of promoting contraception and its necessary consequences, that human beings will become like animals. He calls them brutes. That's the way they talked in 1948 will say animals, that people will become like animals again. Okay, well, so if you look at it like that, then contraception is not an important question. It's not the most important question. It is the only question because the whole of the future of the church and of the world is at stake. Why did this fellow write in terms that I think a lot of people agreed with in those days, 1948? Why did this fellow talk in those terms? Well, you got to go back a little bit farther. Back in 1930, there was, I guess everybody here knows, there was what's called the Lambeth Conference. The Anglicans met every 10 years. They discussed everything, and in 1930, they finally allowed for contraception in their, uh, in their, the church under, for important reasons, you're allowed to contracept. And the Pope re reacted very quickly with a letter called Casti Canubi, which stated in no uncertain terms that there could, you can never contracept. It's part of the constant teaching of the church and it's really unchangeable. So, okay, why does leaving contraception as a possibility, why, is that, why does that mean the end of civilization? 
Well, what happened after the Lambeth Conference of 1930 was there was a reaction of initial horror by a lot of people, and then every Protestant denomination caved. And I think the last non-Catholic denomination to cave in were the Orthodox. They're not Protestants, but they were the Orthodox, and they have caved in modern times so that you can contracept, but you can't use contraceptives that are abortifacients. So the whole world, by the time you got to 1948, the whole world around the Catholic Church was, uh, was contracepting with the approval of the religious communities. Now he's talking about a situation in which the Catholic Church was firm within itself. People contracepted, Catholics contracepted in 1948 but everybody knew it was wrong. If you went to a priest, every priest would tell you it's wrong, however delicately, however good a confession they might be, but in the end, there's the notion, it's wrong, they have to move you away from that toward a chaste married life. Everybody knew it, it was a universal thing. The church was compact within itself. I don't know what this fellow Marr would have said in 1968 when the church itself splittered and exploded in regard to contraception. So there's, he thought that if the world didn't accept the church's teaching, we'll have a new dark age. If the, and we're in a situation where that the world doesn't accept it is taken for granted but the Catholic Church and the vast majority, the vast, vast majority of its members, and in the, a rather large majority of its priests, and functionally, I would say that every, almost every bishop holds to the church's teaching on contraception, but functionally doesn't act according to the teaching of contraception. So in a state, a state of complete debilitation, the church has completely lost its compact nature as, a, uh, as the defender and promoter of, of, the, of the sexual ethic. Why does civilization have to simply dissolve if contraception becomes not only allowed, but a way of life, which is what we have? It's, it's, a way of, it's a, an institutionalized way of life in the society, in the political society, in the, in the media, and in the Catholic Church too. It's been institutionalized. Why does this have to happen? Well, you might or might know that not, you might or might not know that I'm trained, I'm a biblicist by profession. I've spent most of my life studying or teaching sacred scripture. And the Pope has asked, Pope Benedict XVI has asked that the, the church's teaching on contraception be, be explained more clearly, that it become, be explained in such a way that people start to understand what it's about. So Martin the Biblicist is going to try to explain the church's teaching on contraception and uh, the seriousness of it. There's that famous passage in, that John Paul II uses, I'm going to use it slightly differently in a way that will not contradict him, that John Paul II uses, but I'm going to use, it's the famous passage, the, this is the, the woman is brought to the man after she's, the, she's built up from his rib, God brings her to the man, he says, this is, this at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, this is why a man leaves his, uh, his, his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two become one flesh. The two become one flesh. Well, you can go into commentaries and, and find that you try to figure out what exactly they mean by one flesh. The Hebrew word for flesh is basar. You can write that down, B-A-S-A-R, or any other way that you want to write it. it it's, it's a Hebrew word, however you like to trans transliterate. So, uh, for example, it usually means a human person uh, as opposed, in his weakness or in need of others. For example, if you remember in the Gospel of Matthew, Peter 
confesses that Jesus Christ is, is Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, flesh and blood did not tell you that, reveal that to you, but my Father in heaven. That it's something that can't be known or revealed by a human being, by a man, but it's something that has to be divinely given. So flesh is the human being, it's a human person. So the two become one. Flesh would mean, if that's the way we take basar, it would mean that it's talking about the personal union between the husband and the wife. It can also mean the male sexual organ. Ezekiel goes into diatribes about, well, I don't want to go into it, but it's the male sexual organ. And uh, so that's pretty obvious that if the two become one basar, one flesh in that sense, that it's talking about the, the act of sexual intimacy, sexual relations, the conjugal act. And it can also mean the child because the two then become one flesh in the child. And if you look at commentaries, all of those possibilities are entertained. The union, the marital act, the child. In a Western mind, my mind, your mind, even though I'm Jewish, I was born a Jew and, and trained that way, even so, I'm a West, we're all Westerners. We tend to think, well, which one is it? Is it the marital union? Is it the sexual act? Is it the child? Well, we have to go back. Here's your first biblical experience, folks. Not your first. We have to go back. And uh, as Pius XII says in the letter, a very important letter, Divino Fonte Spirito, he says, when you study the sacred scripture, you've got to go back in spirit and put yourself into the mind of the ancient Semite. So I took you back to 1948. Now, folks, I'm taking, and I took you back to 1930. Now I'm taking you back to the 10th century BC into a world where everybody thinks differently. And we, we don't like ambiguity. We like the term means this. We were trained, you know, from from our years, if we've had any philosophical training or we've learned from people who've had philosophical training, we want this means this, that means that. The Jew, the ancient Semite, thinks absolutely the opposite way. They love the ambiguity. So if when you want to understand something, you look at it one way, then you look at it another, and then you sort of walk all the way around it in your mind and in your heart. And, you and after a while, you see it. And you don't, you don't think, well, it's this or that. So when the, qu the question comes up to the ancient Semite, because we're now here with the ancient Semites, and we're asking them, does it mean the marital union? Does it mean the sexual act? Does it mean the child? And he says, yes. Yes, it does. So, <clears throat> If we understand the two becoming one flesh that way, then we have exactly the same thing that was said in the letter Humanae Vitae. Because there it said, in the sexual act, the unitive, that is the love union between the husband and the wife, and the child, the openness to the child, cannot be separated. And if we think that, like the Semite, all we have to do is say, the two become one flesh, and it says all of that. Is everybody okay with me now on this? Uh, are, we, are we all swinging here? Okay. <laughs> so. Okay, and then if you think about it a little bit more, the place where the two holding all three together as one thing, still the essential, the most essential is the child. Because that's where, in fact, the two become one flesh. The modern mind understands that better. 
the chromosomes and all that thing. And World War II people become, so to speak, all the traits of two people dating all the way back to the beginning of time. Those traits become the one person. So all that two become one, that is, the union hinges on what is the, the most two become one in flesh. And in fact, it's metaphysics. It's, it's, an actual, it's a reality. There's nothing analogous, right? It's the, it's the child that becomes central. So if you deny the child, then the one fleshness is gone. So we're going to do a lot of work here, a lot of work on with one, the idea of two becoming the one, the one flesh. Okay, Marty, you still haven't explained why it's the end of the world. Well, here's the reason. <clears throat> the guys in, in Genesis, Adam, but he's talking for every human being. It's the whole human situation. As a matter of fact, the writer of Genesis, that part of Genesis, called the Yahwist, He's this theological genius that loves to understand, loves to explain the beginning of all, every important thing in the world. So why do human beings farm? Well, because they were made from the earth. God formed Adam from the dust, blew into his nostrils. Why do uh, uh, women have labor? There was an original sin, and so forth. All of these, uh, he, he wants to explain everything. Well, here he's explaining the whole, in some ways, the whole world around him. The man leaves his father and mother, cleaves to his wife, to use the ancient terminology, and the two become one flesh. He's setting up a new household. He's setting up a new family. Now, if you think about it, no matter how many people are involved, no matter how much land is involved, even if the whole world is involved, it all goes back to that initial procedure of leaving father and mother, cleaving to your wife, and the two becoming one flesh. That is, everything in the world is based on a new household, a new household, a new household. It's one or eight billion or four, well, a household, maybe two billion or three billion. So the whole societal structure of the world hinges on the man leaving his father and mother, cleaving to his wife, and the two become one flesh. When the two stop becoming one flesh, the whole of society, no matter how big or how small, dissolves. So, and considering also for the Semitic mind, all of culture was passed from father to son from family to family, it's the end of all culture. It's the end of society. You can look at it another way. The man looks at the wife and he says, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And then the two become one flesh. What does it mean when you're bone of your bone and flesh of your flesh? Well, the woman doesn't have to be from the same family. Of course, it's not from the same immediate family. You can't marry your sister. So uh, the, the woman, when she's married to the husband, becomes his bone and flesh. And that means, that's an expression of being in the same bloodline. I'll go back to that misstatement I had before. David, when he's going to be brought back after the, uh, the revolution by Absalom, says, yes, you can bring me back. You're bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. That is, mean you're my kin. You're my relatives. You're my blood relatives. My brothers. The Hebrew extended term, you're my brothers. 
So the woman and man, when they become husband and wife, they become blood relatives, even though they don't come necessarily come from the same bloodline. There is a kindred or brotherhood that's established between them and, I guess, then between the, the, the two families. So if they're one flesh, then this bond of blood kinship is something that is established between them and established between the families. If you stop having one fleshness, if you stop being one flesh, then the bond of blood kinship no longer is there. The bond of blood kinship is broken. So that if we are in a world where husband and wife are one flesh, then the brotherhood of man, so to speak, is something that extends throughout the world. If we are in a world in which there is the universal rejection, the, universe, the institutional, political, universal, social, societal rejection of one flesh, then the whole notion of the kinship, brotherhood of every human being is ripped apart. So that all social relationship, not just the things that make us civilized, but the things that make us brothers one to the other, they're all ripped apart and thrown out. Okay, Marty, that was very, very delightful. <laughs> Martin, that was, that was just beautiful. Well, this fellow Mar, and then you, Marty, and others like you, I don't know how many of you are wandering around out there. You're out here, you're out here like chicken little, you know. The, the, <laughs> The sky is falling, the sky is falling, the world is ending. You know, why don't you stand out here with a sign? <laughs> the world's going to end next week. It was this guy, I don't know, he got the day, wrong date, but yeah, why don't you do that? The world's ending, Marty. You know, you're, you're claiming the world isn't ending, Marty. Look up, look up. The sky isn't falling, Marty. And my response is, the sky has fallen. And it's there in pieces at your feet, folks. If you had gone back to 1930 and you had said to somebody in 1930, listen, I'm going to describe a world 50, 70 years and 80 years in the future. And in this world, 90%, over 90% of people fornicate. And it's accepted by everybody. You know, in 1930, the, the infamous, very distressful Kinsey in 1940 published a survey about American sexual um, activity. And in 1940, and I presume it was similar in 1930, the, uh, the number of people that engaged in premarital sex was somewhere below 1%. Somewhere below 1%. And you can attribute most of that to some wild kid unfortunately going off to a prostitute or something like that. It just wasn't, uh, it wasn't known. So uh, the, and now we have something well over 90% of, of people commit a, a sexual acts outside of marriage. If I would go to the same people in 1930 and say that the number of live births in the cultural center of America, that is New York City, maybe the cultural, there's a good case, it's the cultural center of the world, and I would say that the number of live births was outnumbered by the a number of abortions in that city, they would have gone gasp. If I would have said to you that the, uh, that people who were the same sex were being allowed to marry in that same cultural center and in other places, they would have looked 
kind of been bowled over. And if I would have said that the, the number of divorces was pretty much the same as the number of people who stayed married at 50 percent, if I would have said that more people are raised in a single parent household than are raised in a two-parent household, that is that non-family households outnumber family households, and I would have said, what do you think about that? They might say, well, that's the end. You're describing the end of civilization. So if you look at it as a Christian, if you look at it as someone who sees the interior reality, civilization is lying in rubble at our feet. And the question is, what in the world can we possibly do about it? Well, as I said before, the, the, the only institution, as an institution, that has remained firm on the question of contraception, which is the cause, contraception is the cause of the end of civilization. I did it biblically, but now I'll do it in other ways. The, the, uh, uh, the letter Humanae Vitae, of course, is considered prophetic because it describes the culture of abortion, the culture of the objectification or the making of woman into a thing of pleasure, and uh, the rampant divorce. Our Lord took the two become one flesh, and what God has joined, let no man set asunder, talking about divorce. Well, if you take the two flesh and you rip it apart by contraception, divorce simply must follow biblically. How do we come, but if we want to talk in terms that the world can understand, how, do we, how does contraception necessarily lead to the world we have today. You know, Paul VI described that world, the world that we have today. And then he said, people of goodwill everywhere, not just Catholics, people of goodwill everywhere, can understand the truth of this, that these consequences have to come about. Well, people of goodwill everywhere didn't understand the truth of it. And even now that the consequences have come about, people of goodwill everywhere seem to be totally obtuse. Their hearts, it just bounces off their hearts. Why do we have to have a culture of divorce? The, the thing is that, that once you accept contraception, then there's just no way out of it. You can accept the, the, the use of human sexuality simply for pleasure. Once it's not open to the life, once it's not open to the responsibility of the life, everything that goes with the life, the household, the job, the, 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 the union, the permanent union of love with husband and wife, once it's not open with the, the openness to the future because you're, you're you're plugged into the society, you're society's agent, so to speak, for the future. You're a public, in some ways, a public personality by being married. Once you accept that you don't, you don't have to have that, once you can block that off, then you can have use human sexuality simply for pleasure. Pope Paul VI sort of with this sort of groan says, you just, you can, ne you just can't have, you can't use human sexuality simply for, for pleasure. Once you can do that, then you can condone anything. You don't have to be married. It can become, as it did in the 60s and then in the 70s, it can become a game. You don't have to be of a different sex. You can condone uh, homosexuality. 
you don't have to stay married to a person because that whole man, woman, child responsibility, all of that has been officially separated. So the world that we live in of fornication, homosexuality, uh, abortion, because abortion, as all we all know, that's just the last means of contraceptive. You can go to Russia, and that they don't contracept. They use every every woman. Most women have seven, eight, nine abortions because that's the way they do their family planning. So the the uh, the everything every, the the society that the way that we have it today, which I've turned the end of termed the end of civilization. That society is built upon, traces itself back in every instance to the acceptance, the widespread acceptance of, of contraception. <clears throat> how important or how firmly does the church teach about contraception? Well, you hear you heard a, a lot of people say that the church doesn't teach about it firmly. You had important, very important people. There was a fellow named Bernard Herring, who was, I guess in the early 60s, many considered him the most prominent moral theologian in the world. And in fact, he was on that commission, the famous commission that John the 23rd set up and then Paul VI expanded, and they came back telling the Pope that we can now contracept, and the Pope didn't accept it and came out with the letter Humanae Vitae. Well, he was, he was a, a very important guy and written some very important works, and he had a reputation as a, he was looked upon with reverence, but he caved. He dissented on that. Well, he spent the rest of his life dissenting more and more and more toward, till towards the end he accepted abortion in certain instances, sex outside of marriage in certain instances, and he died with a sort of a personal vendetta against the Pope, a very important theologian. Well, people point to him. This is a very important guy. He says that the church's teaching on contraception is sort of, you know, optional. And then there was the, uh, there are the notorious, even more notorious characters that are still alive, Charles Curran and uh, McBrien and all of this, this, these folk. And then the most famous theologian of the 20th century, uh, Karl Rahner, who everybody considers him the greatest, not everybody, I don't. And not just because I, I, of the whole, I, the position I hold on contraception, I was trained by the Dominicans he was a Jesuit. Dominicans don't think a Jesuit think was the greatest was the greatest theologian in the 20th century. Well, you have to be kidding me. Okay, so, <laughs> but there were there were Dominicans that came, that came to Skillabix was a, one of the stars of, of the Dominican sphere, and he he went off the deep end after he he uh, descended on contraception. But Karl Rahner brought in this whole theology of descent. And he had the, the fact that human beings are such that you can, never, you can never speak of unchangeable moral laws because we're all out here and we're subject to change in the circumstances to such a great deal. So he sort of was the, the, the guru that underlay the whole theology of descent. Well, is, is this theology of descent, is it descent or is it a reasonable theological position? Because you hear so many people say, and most of the, if you go to most parishes, the majority of priests will say, well, you have to follow your conscience on the issue. Well, you have to follow your conscience on every issue, but the question is, how do you form your conscience? The conscience doesn't decide. You follow your conscience, but the conscience doesn't decide. The conscience judges, and it judges by looking at everything that it can. 
So you hear, well, the Pope has said his piece and you have to respect him and he's the Pope. And then you have to listen to him and other people too and ta-da-da-da. Well, the teaching on contraception is as sure as God is God. If the teaching could, on contraception could change, then God could change. Well, we don't have to be professional metaphysicians here to know that God can't change. So it's built on the natural law, and the church has the ability to speak to the natural law, and it can speak to it with real authority. And it says that the, that the openness to life in the marital act is, as, as a necessity, is built into the human being. And it's built into the human being not because God said, hey, let's do a thing where you have to not, can't contracept and let's build that into the human beings. And all the angels said, sounds good, let's do it. No, because the, the, being, the being built into the human being is an image of God himself. In the end, it is built upon, it is based in the very nature of God. I was, in a, I was a graduate student for a couple of years at UCLA doing church history. I left there to become eventually a biblicist. But one of the fellows that I, uh, it was not, well, hard to call him a fellow, he was an old, very old and older and distinguished man, and he was a Catholic. He was the, the resident Catholic on the faculty, and he was the head of the American, at one, at one time, the head of the American Medievalist Association. He was a prominent guy. And I was in a class on church history. It was the second class I had taken with him. And I, was, I liked the guy a lot. In fact, I, even after this incident that I'm going to relate, I asked him to be the, the sponsor of my confirmation. I had been baptized, but they didn't baptize and confirm adults at the same time. You, I was confirmed a couple years later, so... So, and I, had, I knew him after that. But anyways, we were in the, in the class, and somebody asked, well, out of the blue, I guess, asked, well, the church is, uh, what about the church's teaching on contraception? You have to remember this was in 1970 or 71. And so in the end, he says, well, I think that someday it's going to have to change. Now, I hadn't been a Catholic for that long. But I had been raised an Orthodox Jew. My, uh, my rabbi had been, in his later years, the head rabbi of the United States. The head Orthodox rabbi, but for an Orthodox Jew, that meant the head rabbi of the United States. His father, Eliezer Silver, was the head rabbi of the United States from 1932 to 1969, either he was officially in the position, it didn't matter whether he was or wasn't, he was the head rabbi of the United States. It's called the Silver Period. They had been Orthodox rabbis since before anybody could ever remember or before any written records. So the notion, even though I fell away from Judaism, I was a black sheep, the notion of Orthodoxy was imprinted in me as Religion and orthodoxy simply can't be ever separated. So even in my, in my casting around period at the beginning, uh, after, right soon after my conversion, I knew that orthodoxy in revealed religion, that was it. And so as soon as he said, I, I said my piece that it, that it was unchangeable and so forth. As soon as he said that, I knew that the guy, and I'm, I'm just a beginning graduate student, I knew the guy didn't know one blessed thing about the history of Catholic dogma. It's hard to say, talk about him because he was a very smart and a very, very lovable guy. So, <clears throat> if you look at the church's teaching on contraception, it was, let's look at it from our day. Uh, Pope Benedict XVI says it's unchangeable. Uh, 
uh, John Paul II spoke about it over and over and over again. And then uh, towards the end of it, towards the, the latter part of his pontificate, the first part of his, of his pontificate, he spent five years every Wednesday afternoon. I don't know how many people standing out there in the square understood one blessed word that he was saying. I'm a trained theologian, folks, and I, I once tried to teach this, that those five years of stuff is what's called the theology of the body today. Well, that, I once tried to teach a course on the theology of the body. And in the end, I thought I had to stop because all I could do was, like, read it. It's so dense, you really just can't, you just can't, people claim that they can reduce it and make it easily understandable. And there's a guy that goes around, does a lot of good work, don't get me wrong, he does a lot of good work. And, uh, but the, as to whether it can portray the theology of the body, uh, John Paul II had a whole lot to say that it's easy to communicate. But anyways, he, for five years, people in the, stu the, the square were going, and, but he, he came out with this theology of the body, and in the end, he said it, all of it was a, was a development, a defense and development of humanae vitae. That was how important it was to him. Paul VI came out with the letter in the teeth of controversy. Pius XII affirmed the teaching on contraception various times in his pontificate as something that is the same today, yesterday, today, and forever. The letter Casti Canubi was as stern as it could possibly be, so stern that many theologians, prominent theologians at the day, thought it was an infallible declaration of the Pope. So is the letter, is, is the teaching on, the, the, uh, on contraception, is it an infallible and unchangeable teaching of the church? Well, the people who are not particularly happy with the teaching say, well, it's never been defined ex cathedra. Does everybody know what ex cathedra is? The Pope says something to the effect of, uh, I hereby state, declare, and define as a successor to Peter, this such and such to be held by all forever for the end until, the end, until forever. So it's now the Pope never came, the, the, either neither Casti Canubi or John Paul II or Pius XII or Paul VI ever came out with that formula. So it's not an infallible declaration of the church and it's changeable. Well, there are, this is in the theology, now that we finished some of our biblical lessons, this, here's our theology lesson. The, <laughs> there are several ways that something can be infallible, irreformable. One is that it's defined with a, use some, the Council of Trent usually defines something with an anathema. That is, if you don't accept this, you're lost. So, uh, and that if the, if the council says that and it's ratified or in communion with the Pope, then that's infallible. You know, there's a whole lot of decrees from the Council of Trent. And there's some decrees from the First Vatican Council that, that talk about that sort of thing. Or the Pope can define something ex cathedra. I hereby say that we did that. Uh, Pius IX defined the Immaculate Conception. Pius XII defined the Assumption with those formulas. But there's a third way that something can be de fide of divine and Catholic faith. That is, it's, it's, it's infallible by ordinary magisterium of the church. The Second Vatican Council talks about that. They didn't talk about it out of the blue. It's always been held. And this is where, how something is considered to be de fide by ordinary magisterium. If there's any time in the church, it doesn't have to be today, any time in the church where something is taught authoritatively, without exception, by the, all the bishops of the world, it doesn't have to be every last bishop, there could be some guy out there in the jungle someplace that goes a little bit wacko. But if the, if the, if the moral majority of the church, if the moral majority of the church, a, a moral unanimity of bishops in union with the Pope teach something, and especially if the, the Pope teaches something, if there's any time when that's done, 
That's de fide by ordinary magisterium. It belongs to the deposit of faith. It's of divine and Catholic truth. Now, just to give an example, let's go back to 1930, when Pius XI issued his letter, Casti Canubi. Well, if you went around the world polling bishops as to whether contraception is a valid or invalid thing to do, and there's a fellow named Noonan who wrote a book on the history of contraception. He did all the work, the legwork on this. He came to the wrong conclusion, amazingly, but he did all the legwork. If you had gone all around the world, there wouldn't have been one bishop that would have stated that contracepting is a valid or good act. Every bishop in the world would have stated with a great deal of assurance that contraception is a wicked act. If you had gone to theologians, theologians don't count in this, folks, but if you had gone for de fide by ordinary magistrate, it has to do with the bishops and the pope, but if you had gone to theologians, there would have, you would have hardly been, I don't think you would have been able to find one that was, a, that was simply accepted as a theologian in the Catholic Church that would have said that, the, uh, that, that contracepting is a valid act. That state of affairs, and you, you could have gone back to 1900, you could have gone back to 1850, 1750, and whenever you wanted to, and that unity, unanimity among bishops would have been there. There is no possibility whatsoever that the church's teaching humani vitae, the church's teaching on contraception, is anything but de fide by ordinary magisterium. That means it binds. And if people knew what they were doing and saying, and they don't, but if they do knew what they were doing and saying, that to deny the church's teaching on contraception is an act of heresy, folks. It's an act of heresy.